which is an idea I think that, that we often think of and we don't do. Um, at the age of 18, I moved back to India and I walked into a big urban slum area and I sat down and I started teaching. And that's been the beginning of, for me, a, a completely incredible journey of understanding a little bit about what it means to maximize human potential. And so today, I'm extremely excited to talk to you about an idea called uh, Teach for India. And when I was thinking about how to do it and how to keep it simple at the same time, um, I thought I'd introduce you to two children and get you to think about two questions. And this is not working, sorry. <laughs> I can do it, don't worry. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so, two children um, and two questions and three stories. This is the first child. She's mine. Um, and she's sitting in the front row there. Her name is Samara um, and she's 11 years old. Um, and I want to just tell you a little bit about her. She goes to a private school in Mumbai. She has lots of friends. She has a family who adores her. Um, she basically has all the resources that she needs to do whatever she chooses to do. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Oh, my God. Here's the second child. Her name is Seema. This is when she was about the same age as Samara. She's one of my Akanksha children. She lives in a tiny 10 foot by 10 foot room. Um, she doesn't have a father. Both her elder brothers dropped out of school. She goes to a municipal school. She has very similar dreams to Samara. My questions to you are this. When you think about Samara, and the Samaras of the world, do we believe that children like Samara have everything that they need to maximize their potential? We probably think yes. When we think about the Seemas of the world and we look at the reality of what they go through, do we believe that they have what they need and we give them what they need to maximize their potential? These three numbers keep me up at night. If you think about the population of school-going children in this country, it's about 320 million children. The first number, 10%, represents the kids who won't even get into the system. That's about 32 million children. They won't even start. The second number, about 160 million, is the number of kids who won't make it to class five. They'll drop out before they get a primary school education. And the third number, perhaps the most frightening, is the number of kids who will not complete successfully secondary, secondary school. They will not have a basic education degree that will enable them to have choice in life. These numbers scare me. And this is my life mission. The other side of this is the tremendous opportunity. When you think about where India is today, despite this, 
think about if we can flip these numbers. If every child in our country gets an excellent education, where will our country be? Where will our world be? My three stories are about people that didn't get overwhelmed by those numbers, but asked themselves a very simple question. What will I do about it? What will I do about it? This is Fiona. She's a Teach for India fellow. She graduated from St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. She had lots of opportunities to do different things, but instead she chose to teach for two years full time in a low income school in Malad. That's her class. And that's her student, Rohit. Six months into teaching, well actually on the first day of teaching, she administered a diagnostic for her kids. And she realized that her kids tested, they were in class three, they tested at a pre-K level. They couldn't write or read a complete sentence in English. Six months later, Fiona goes as part of a trip to the US. And she sees some outstanding schools for some of the lowest income kids. And in one of those classrooms, she sees a teacher who has a big goal up on the wall. And that big goal says, my students will read 200 books by the end of the year. And so Fiona comes back and she looks at her kids and she says, I think we can read 200 books by the end of the year. And two months ago, I was in her classroom and the kids had their hands up and one kid said 150 and one kid said 320 and Rohit said 267. These kids had all read between 150 and 360 books in one year. That was the progress she was able to make. My second story is about a Teach for India fellow who used to work with Accenture and quit to come and teach in a school in Pune. He had about 50 kids in his class. The kids were aged 8 to 13. And Ashish, who you see there, was one of the smallest children. And when Gaurav went in, he couldn't believe the aggression that he saw in this child. On the second or third day of school, he came into class and Ashish had pinned down a group of girls and he was bashing them. And Ashish refused to do anything. He didn't want to learn. He didn't want to be there. He didn't care about his life. He refused to do his homework. And Gaurav tried everything. He went home with him every day. He kept him after school. He gave him incentives. And everything he did failed. He failed and he failed and he failed. And eight months later, one day, for some reason, Ashish completed his homework. And Gaurav made it like a Miss Universe pageant in class the next day. He made it such a big deal that this boy had done this. And that was the turning point for little Ashish. He didn't become the brightest child in the class, but he got invested in learning. He got invested in himself. My third story is about a fellow called Srini. Srini worked for eight years on oil rigs around the world with Schlumberger and then left to teach in a municipal school in Dharavi. That's his child, Samir. Within one week, this little child, Samir, was transferred to the other shift in the school, which would mean he would no longer be in Srini Bayar's classroom. It had just been one week. Little Samir went home and told his mother, I'm not going back to school unless you go and meet the principal and change my shift. The mother was very surprised. She'd never heard her son talk about school in this way. So he, he, he literally refused to go to school. So she went to the principal. She had to go five days in a row because the principal wouldn't see her. And on the fifth day, she went in and little Samir went in and he articulated reasons why he wanted to be in Srinibaya's class. You see, he said, Srinibaya doesn't hit me. 
Srini Baya smiles all the time in class. Srini Baya teaches through dancing and singing. Srini Baya says, I can be whatever I want to be. Srini Baya says, one day, I will speak better English than him. This six-year-old was able to articulate in one week the reasons why he wanted to stay in Srini Baya's class. What does all of this mean? On the surface, Fiona is teaching her children to read books. But what is she learning? At the end of two years when she leaves, she has learned that no matter how big that goal is, if you believe in it, if you're able to invest stakeholders in it, you are going to get there. What has Gaurav learned? That it's all about trying. You try and you fail and you try and you fail and you try and you fail and one day something good is going to happen. And what has Srini Baya learned? That it is love that can change the world. These are three of the 200 odd Teach for India fellows who have left their corporate jobs, who have graduated from top schools to come and spend two years teaching. The interesting thing about it is our belief is that to be a transformational teacher and to learn what it takes to be in the most challenging classroom transforms you into a transformational leader, a leader that has the understanding, the skills, the hope and belief, the understanding of what it takes to fix educational inequity. Those are our fellows. Um, they are currently placed in Mumbai, Pune. We're launching in Delhi this year. We're going to be pan-India India soon. We talk about the jigsaw of educational inequity. We say for two years, Let's go through this shared experience together. We understand it's going to be the hardest thing that these young people do in their lives, but two years is just the beginning. The idea is that at the end of the two years, they will populate the pieces of this puzzle. Some of them will go back into the corporate sector, but they're going to go back and make sure that their companies contribute to ending educational inequity. Some of those will go into media, but they're going to make sure that the media talks about the issues of educational inequity. Some of them will stay in the sector. They'll go into teacher training. They'll lead schools. They will prove that every child, irrespective of their background, with excellent opportunity, can maximize their potential. Our aim in the next five years is to have 2,000 fellows across the country, 1,000 fellows graduating every year and going out and fighting the fight. I want to end by going back to the story of Seema. Seema, in all likelihood, was headed down the road of the statistics that I showed you. She had a 90% chance of not completing school. But Seema was lucky. Seema met when she was 10 years old one of the most incredible teachers I've ever met. She's there on the right. Her name's Rajshri Didi. When Seema came into Rajshri Didi's class, she didn't come. She had to be dragged. Every day, Rajshri Didi would go to the slum and pull Seema and bring her to class. She didn't want to study. She didn't speak a word. She didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. And Rajshri had unwavering belief in her. She believed in Seema when Seema didn't believe in herself. And she stayed with her day in and day out for 10 years. And then one year ago, Seema graduated from college. And Seema's dream was to go into the corporate world, to do an MBA, to do really well, to really do something for her mother, who she loved very dearly. She wanted to take her mother out of poverty. And in the same week, last year, she got admission 
into one of the top MBA programs in the country. And she had also applied to the Teach for India program, and she got selected as a Teach for India fellow. And she came to me and she said, Didi, I don't know what to do. My whole life I've wanted to do an MBA and I've got into this MBA program, but I'm also torn. I also want to do Teach for India. And she'd been, you know, our selectivity is just 6%. She'd been selected from thousands of applicants and she didn't know what to do. And I said, Seema, you'll figure it out. Listen to your heart. And Seema chose Teach for India. That's her now. She's relocated to Pune. She has 40 kids of her own. And when I spoke to Seema months later and I said, Seema, why? Why did you choose Teach for India over the MBA and the corporate? And she said, you know, Didi, a transformational teacher changed my life. I want to try and be that person for 40 more kids. Thank you.